take your Bibles and turn to Leviticus chapter 10, and we're going to look at verses uh, 1 to 4. You, for you little ones, that's the third book in the Bible, in your Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 10. Uh, and I was thinking this past week about when I was um, uh, when I was growing up, raised as a uh, kid in a church, and um, just to get very, very personal for just a moment, um, I was raised with a uh, with a fear of God, <coughs> and it was a fear of God that I, that I think was basically could be described as the fear that just about any time I slip out of line, I am going to be uh, summarily executed. Uh, by the Lord. I, I lived with this very, very severe fear that God is intemperate and that He's just waiting to destroy me. That was, that was traumatic growing up, I'm here to tell you. Uh, but what happened was, over a period of time, I kind of moved away from that. And as I got into high school in particular, I developed this attitude that God is not someone to be feared at all. And in fact, I don't even really see any reason to particularly try to obey the Lord at all. And I lost my fear of God. I lost my sense of respect for Him. I stopped seeing myself as a sinner. And I abandoned even caring what God thought at all. Now, I was not a regenerate believer at that time, so it's no wonder that my theology was so messed up. Uh, the church certainly helped mess it up. Uh, Jason was here, we grew up in the same kind of church, so he can, he can uh, amen that. Uh, but also, the fact that I was not a Christian and was trying to earn favor with God certainly skewed my theology badly. Well, that is just, all that is to simply say, we're going to look at two people this morning in this passage in Leviticus 10, and I think they're somewhere in between those two uh, extremes. It's not that they don't have a fear and reverence for God, they do. And it's not that they have an irrational fear of God. They don't. They're, they don't think that the two characters we're going to see are particularly uh, worried that God is going to destroy them. But the problem is, is that somewhere in the middle of this, they lose some of their sense of respect and reverence for Him. Not entirely, okay, but just enough. And I've titled this message, Holy and profane. What we're going to do is look this morning and see how God does something miraculous, but unlike the miracles of grace and mercy and compassion that we have been seeing in this study so far, this is a morbid miracle. It is a miracle of death. And um, we're going to see God's point, what He is saying to us about holiness and how He cares more about His holiness than anything else at all. He cares, church, whether or not we regard him as holy, or whether or not we, or whether we regard him as profane. And so, with these thoughts in mind, let's look at this passage from Leviticus 10, and we're going to see what we can learn about the holy and profane from a most striking miracle, if you would. This is God's holy word. Hear it. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans. And after putting fire in them, placed incense on it, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron, therefore, kept silent. This is God's will work. Uh, if there's anything, church, that we can uh, learn from the presidential election, which mercifully <laughs> comes to a conclusion in a few weeks, uh, it is that America has undoubtedly lost its sense of holiness. Uh, I wondered about that a few days ago. You know, why has our nation lost its sense of holiness? That's not to say, by the way, that we ever did have a kind of sense of holiness that aligns with Scripture, but it, it would seem that we had at least some fear <coughs> of the Lord. Maybe. But it seems like it is all but gone. I think perhaps our problem today is that we confuse certain terms with holiness that are not actually holiness. 
Let me give you a few examples. Some churches would say, no one in our congregation has ever been divorced, so we're holy. Because we value marriage. And it's true, marriage is to be valued, and there's a sense in which marriage is holy, but there are unbelievers who've never been divorced. That doesn't necessarily make you holy. And they say, well, you know, I've never cheated, Christians will say, I've never cheated on my spouse, I've never been unfaithful. Uh, and that certainly is holy, but really it's morality is what it amounts to, and what it is attached to Christ. Someone may say, I know I'm holy because I work and hard and I provide for my family, and that's biblical, but that's really virtue is what that is. It doesn't necessarily prove you value holiness. Uh, you may point to the fact that you don't, you, know, you don't smoke, you don't overindulge in alcoholic beverages, you don't eat fast food too often, and that may prove that you have temperance, okay? but it doesn't necessarily mean you value holiness. You may be living a healthy lifestyle. It doesn't mean it's a holy lifestyle. My point is simply this. We tend to confuse, don't we, virtue and morality and temperance, all things that even unbelievers practice, with real Christ-centered, God-fearing holiness. I mean, even our worship, although it may be sincere and exciting and joyful and contagious, it may fail to exalt the Lord. And although it may sound and look pure and acceptable to God, it may be anything but that. What is real holiness? What is the holiness that Scripture speaks of? It is to regard and to treat and to approach God as He is and on His terms. And that brings us to the sin that results in the tragedy of Leviticus 10. But before we get to the tragedy, would you glance with me back at chapter 9 and look with me at verse 22. Here is a beautiful event that closes out this chapter. Aaron lifts up his hands toward the people. He blesses them. He steps down after making the sin offering and the burnt offering, the peace offering. And Moses and Aaron go into the tent of meeting. And when they come out, they bless the people. And look at what the text says. The glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Then fire came out before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces God gave his approval of the priesthood and the sacrificial system, and the fire is a sign of that approval. His glory appears. The people fall on their faces in worship. What would we give to have a church service of that dramatic, and that glorious, and that unforgettable? But chapter 10 is an inauguration of the priesthood and the sacrificial system, and initially, Things go terribly wrong. Church life, by the way, can be like that. You know, you can have a Sunday where it's packed out. Uh, you know, I've had pastors. We, we closed out with three baptisms today. And uh, then the next week, the, the chairman of the deacons resigns and admits that he's having an extramarital affair. Uh, I, I have a pastor friend that uh, had a domestic abuse incident uh, going on in his church and it ended up on the news. Uh, he had an elder that tried to confront somebody that was in sin. It turned into an altercation. And even though the elder was in the right, in terms of his approach, the way in which he carried it out, punching the guy in the face, uh, was a bit extreme. <laughs> and he had to come to our prayer group and, uh, it was about a year or two ago and say, yeah, I really need prayer for this situation. That's, although that's... Uh, seems rather strange and exceptional. Those kinds of things go on more often in churches than we may uh, be aware of. You can have one week this spiritual high for a week or a season, and then the church has to go through great sorrow and hardship, and this is especially true when it seems as though the Lord himself is actually displeased with your church. The book of Leviticus is a recording of of the laws that were revealed to Moses at Mount Sinai after they were liberated from slavery. The book is a continuation of the stipulations of the Mosaic Covenant. Think about this. Exodus ends with the completion of the tabernacle. Leviticus records how the people are to worship in this new tabernacle with a detailing of sacrifices and offerings. And if you ever read Leviticus, which I encourage you to do, you will see a phrase repeat it over and over again. I have read it so many times, it just comes to me sometimes, arbitrarily. 
And the phrase is, it is most holy. God does not inaugurate the temple system and then leave it to the people to figure out how to administer it. He tells them what is holy and he tells them what is not, but the priesthood is in charge of continuing to separate the holy from the profane. The commentator Rooker notes the, the sacrificial system in the tabernacle were gifts from God. They enabled the people to serve him in purity and holiness. When we say God is holy, we are saying He is unlike us. He is superior to us. He is pure. He is without fault. He is without weakness. He is transcendent above us, in other words. But the miracle of miracles is that God made a way through Christ for sinful people to approach Him and not to be cast out. But the sacrificial system is prior to Jesus' atonement. It satisfied God's requirements for Israel in the interim so that they could approach Him. But they had to approach Him on His, on his terms, and not their own. Now that brings us to Nadab and Abihu. They are Aaron's sons. They are brand new priests. They have Aaron as their father. They have Moses as their uncle. They have a strong pedigree of faithfulness and courage and devotion to the Lord. But apparently, that was not enough. Many commentaries and many sermons have treated this issue of strange fire. What does this mean, strange fire? What in the world did David and Abihu uh, do that caused this kind of cosmic reaction from the Lord? As priests, they violated the standard that God had set out. In a word, they were careless. Exodus 19, listen, warns the priesthood to be careful. The Lord came down from Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses, and Moses went up, and the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down, warn the people, so that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. Then the Lord said to him, Go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break through upon them. So Moses went down to the people and told them, Now they have if I you knew that to be a priest meant you regard God as holy. You set the bar high for the people. You don't arrogantly deviate from what God has already prescribed. Now the main issue here seems to be with the fire itself. Some have suggested the incense had the wrong ingredients. Some have suggested, no, the problem is they went too far into the sanctuary uh, because Leviticus 16, errors were united. You cannot enter behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies except on the Day of Atonement. I sometimes like to aggravate you guys. Sorry, so Jesus. Jason, <laughs> as you all know, I come into the sanctuary through a curtain. But see, that is a human issue. This is a God issue. It would seem, however, that the problem is really with the fire. It is strange fire that is offered to God. One commentator suggests that what's strange is that the fire was offered to foreign deities, to false gods. That would certainly be strange and unlawful and wicked. We know, we all know, that Israel came down from the mountain, having just had that Mount Sinai experience, and what did they do? They crafted a golden calf to worship as God. So it wouldn't be the first time they had dabbled in idolatry, but it's hard to say what the strange fire was all about. Was it about false deities? We don't know. But fire came down from God and He consumed these sons. That is... Is it not a horrifying verse to read in Scripture? Fire came down from God and consumed them. It is horrifying to us. It is perhaps even appalling to us. And you want to know why? Because we don't appreciate the holiness of God as we should. I put it in a different way. We underestimate God's holiness. We overestimate our own. We have a God problem. We think too highly 
of ourselves. We think too little of the one who created all things. That is why this election is so atheistic. It has two candidates. One, or I should say, both of which have a dim view of scriptural authority. In America, although they're complaining about how terrible they are, we're really championing them all the way to the polls. We say we're appalled, but we're really applauding because the holiness of God and its influence on the nation means very well to us. God does to Nadab and Abihu what their sin deserved. It is harsh, it is unmerciful, it is severe, but it was not without notice. God had put the priesthood on notice. The priesthood had to be careful of how they administered the worship in the temple before the people of God and in His presence. Listen, if ministers are sloppy, if they are careless, if the ministers, the priests, if they send the message that God is not a threat, if they send the message that God is not worthy of our most thoughtful and scrupulous worship, then the people in town will treat God in the very same way. And that really is a mutiny on the part of God's people. To worship Him in whatever way they wish, disregard who He is, disregard what He has said, worship is inverted in this model, isn't it? Man becomes the subject of the worship, that's not it. Man becomes the object, right? These two sons of Aaron died by the fire of the Lord. Now, the fire did not incinerate the bodies. Okay? I have to admit, many times I have read this passage, I'm always envisioning they have to buy you as crispy french fries at the bottom of the box. But if this is a non-incinerating fire. The sons did not burn up. We know that because they are later carried out by other relatives. There is one relative who stands before us in this passage, and what he says is astounding. He says nothing. But we're going to come back to him in a moment. Look at, what, look at how Moses responds. And by the way, it may very well be that Moses pulled Aaron aside and said, Aaron, I'm so sorry this happened to you. We've lost two sons, two out of four. I'm here for you. I, I know how you feel. You know, uh, cry on my shoulder if you wish. But the text is not concerned with the grief of Aaron, but rather with the dishonor of God. And so Moses responds with the way it says, church. It is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. Moses is saying, Aaron, you know that that's what God said. You didn't dispute it then, Aaron. Don't dispute it now. I said last week, God keeps track of our sorrows. I reminded you that God is a God of mercy and compassion. We were reminded of Jesus who stopped to heal two blind men, and that's just one miracle of many. We know that just as the Father killed, the Son raises to life. That doesn't mean that God the Father is the bitter and angry and impatient member of the Trinity, and Jesus is the diplomat. Okay, That's the false dichotomy you will sometimes hear by unsound teachers. Reject that when you hear it. But this is, admittedly, a severe time of history to be a follower of God. It is an age of example. See, example after example is put forth to show and to teach the people that God cannot be treated as just one of us. We know, even as parents, when your children are young, discipline is probably more frequent, it's more immediate, and maybe it's more severe. As your children learn to respect and honor you, there's room for leniency. I don't discipline them to them like I did when they were five. God does show mercy in the Old Testament, though. This example is, even this example is, in a sense, mercy. Because the deaths of Nadab and Abihu are a warning to the entire community so they won't all be eliminated. Preaching about the judgment of God, listen, preaching about the so-called warning passages of Scripture, preaching about hell may seem harsh and severe, at the very least unpleasant, 
but it is necessary lest many end up eternally banished by the Lord having not heard the way of the truth. So when Moses says to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke, he is saying, Aaron, we were already warned. And now the Lord is warning us again. He is defending the character of God. Is God unrighteous to have taken the lives of these two priests, sons of Aaron, no less, nephews of Moses? Surely if anybody deserves a break, it's them. That's the way we mess with justice. You know somebody? You might be able to get some strength for it. But see, God is not like us. God is not unjust in doing this because, listen very carefully, the way in which sinful man approaches God is not a matter of personal choice, but a matter of divine precept. It may have been a matter of negligence on their part. Maybe they set out to do things the right way. They simply got careless. We all do. We can all sympathize with sloppiness in ministry, carelessness in parenting, Crash our, rather than rushing through our responsibilities and doing them in a haphazard way. We say we want to do all things for the glory of God, but realistically we miss the mark more often than we care to admit. Sometimes it's just an accident. Yesterday when I went there cleaning, I had a nice big cup of coffee right there on the kitchen counter, and I reached up for the comet or whatever it is, and all of a sudden with a reverberating crash, it hit the coffee cup, and coffee went everywhere. And the cup went everywhere. And I had been in the middle of prayer. <laughs> and it was one of those moments I had to laugh about it, but I thought, Lord, why would you do this in the middle of my prayer? <laughs> we can understand, you know, we make mistakes, and sometimes there can be some consequences, but there was no malicious intent. We don't know what the intent here was. But Calvin, writing on this passage, says this. He says, he doesn't think Nadab and Abihu were intentionally profaning anything, but he adds this, if we reflect how holy a thing God's worship is, the enormity of the punishment will by no means offend us. If we're offended at this, not merely shocked, but offended, angered with God, or cynical, or tempted to say, boy, that's as wild like the New Testament. It's either, it's either because we don't understand the doctrine of God's holiness as we should, or we don't think God is as holy as the Bible and says that he is. He is so holy that he could not even look upon his own son who was on the cross because his son assumed the role of a sinner. Not a sinner, but assuming that role. In the sense, he is substituting in the sinner's place. And even though Jesus did not actualize any sin, he committed no error, he dishonored his father not once, but he has nevertheless substituted so that God's holy wrath does not fall on the sinner as it does in Leviticus 10. Now, I don't see any reason to read into this that they have an abide in the hell. I don't think there's anything in the passage that suggests we can go that far. But clearly God is sending a strong message to his people. <clears throat> Be holy as I am holy. That's Leviticus 11, 44. The Apostle Peter, this is where you probably know it from. 1 Peter 3, the same message to the church. God's people are to reflect in our attitude and our worship a deep devotion and reverence for him. Which means when we treat him with reckless disregard, when we worship him by our own conventions, we are saying in effect, Lord, you're, you're not as holy as you think you are. The sins of these priests could be described as pride, presumption, and perversion. Pride in the sense that they must have assumed at some point that God would be okay with whatever they did. Okay? Presumption in assuming he would not punish them for it. And perversion in the sense that instead of doing it his way, they did it their way. Again, this is not to say that they maliciously set out to blaspheme him. This does not have to be interpreted as an act of rebellion, although it may have been. But at the very least, they downgraded holiness enough to provoke his anger. Moses is there. He reminds Aaron, don't murmur. Do not respond with a cry of unjust. And Aaron says a lot by saying nothing. 
Aaron kept silent. In refusing to murmur, in refusing to complain, in refusing to charge God with a capital crime, Aaron is saying, You know what, Moses? You're right. He is holy. He is worthy of honor. And God's judgment, severe as it is, is right. Darcy Sproul says this is one of the greatest understatements in the Bible. Aaron kept silent. What would you do with that? Having witnessed this, Aaron held his peace. I think Aaron was undoubtedly struck with a holy fear. By the way, young people, this is one of your parents. Tell them no. Yes, do this. Don't do that. When you respond with yes, without argumentation, you're showing not only the respect and reverence now, but you're showing the respect and reverence to the Lord. But that is a reminder to us as well as parents to model that. We say yes to the Lord without qualification. Now, I understand that this means, of course, you know, Aaron's silence, his quiet agreement, means that, you know, if, he, if, he, if God takes anything from us, including that which is most precious to us, are we going to still love and honor Him? Even for tears and our wages. If God takes that which you most love and which is most precious to you, whatever it is you want, He takes it. If you can say at the end of that, He is still holy, I will still wear this now. You are saying that you value His holiness above everything else in the universe. Now, I know the criticisms of the world. Your God is a maniac. Your God has anger issues. If that's your God, no thanks. I will never worship a God like that. I've had people say that. I've heard the blasphemous comments of people when you've had to put a passage like this on your Facebook timeline. I know the world hates the attribute of holiness in God. But let me be honest. That is not just because the unbeliever has a... That is not because the unbeliever has a greater sense of holiness than God, but because he has no real sense of holiness at all. See, let me tell you this. You can underestimate holiness by either being a legalist or by being an antinomian. You say, what's that? I'll tell you in just a moment. A legalist, here's what a legalist does. A legalist runs to the law and runs to the rules to find justification for himself. In so doing, he underestimates holiness because holiness is never achieved by mere rule keeping, but by devoting yourself to the rule giver, God. You can have all the rules of morality and ethics in the world memorized and not be devoted to God. You can have all the, uh, you know, you can have everything lined up and not have your faith and trust in the rule keeper, Jesus. Christ, right? There's no holiness in that for us. The only holiness that God will accept comes by faith in the one and only holy man, God's Son. But, but, the antinomian understands God's holiness as well, or misunderstands it, I should say. What's an antinomian? Someone that has no regard for the law. Nomia is Greek word for the law. So an antinomian is someone that has no regard for the law. They may think God will simply accept them on the basis of Christ, and it doesn't mean that anything changes at all. So this is like somebody that says, yeah, I became a Christian, so what, I'm living in adultery. God understands, big deal. I'm saved by grace, right? Or somebody says, yeah, you know, I got saved. Sure, I'm still a racist. I'll be a racist of the day I die. I don't care. God doesn't care. And they have, see, both of these are skewing God's holiness in opposite directions. You see that? Legalism and antinomianism are perversions of God's holiness in the opposite direction. They both have a low view of God's holiness. So what is the right view? Listen, it is to acknowledge by faith that God is most holy, but also acknowledge by faith I am not, and I need Jesus Christ to empower me to live in holiness. Kevin DeYoung, in his recent book, The Whole, in our holiness, writes this. The Bible is realistic about holiness. Don't think that all this glorious talk about dying to sin and living to God means there's no struggle anymore or that sin will never show up in the believer's life. 
The Christian life still entails obedience. It still involves a fight, but it's a fight we will win. And then I like the analogy he uses. He says, you have the Spirit of Christ in your corner, rubbing your shoulders, holding the bucket, putting his arm around you, and saying before the next round with sin, you're going to knock him out of here. Sin may get some good jabs. It may clean your clock once in a while. It may bring you to your knees. But if you're in Christ, it will never knock you out. You are no longer a slave but free. Sin has no dominion over you. It can't. It won't. A new king sits on the throne. You serve a different master. You salute a different lord. There's a footnote to this, by the way. The relatives come, the uncles, and they come and they take the bodies out of the area. Because you know what? Even dead bodies, unable to sin, are defiled before God. They come and they remove the bodies. And the priesthood, including Aaron, are instructed not to mourn. The mourning will be done by the common people, the house of Israel. That may seem doubly cruel. But do you understand that God is so concerned with holiness, he says, priesthood, you can't stop continuing to carry your responsibilities, even for one. You continue to serve. This is a spiritual path, chapter 9, followed by a most serious load that is all God's plan. This is the way. Let me say this. This is the way God drives home the point of God's holiness. The lesson is not always harsh. The miracle is not always one of death, but sometimes it's necessary. Okay? Miracles can show God's holiness when Jesus raises a child from death to life. Miracles can show God's holiness when someone's instantly struck dead. In other words, both the giving and the taking of life are miraculous. And let us not forget the greatest miracle. If you think for one moment that God was cruel to Aaron and cruel to Nadab and cruel to Abihu and cruel to the covenant community and consuming these rookie priests with fire for what may have seemed like a, quote, slight violation or two, what do you say about God killing his own son? He never violated even the smallest detail of the law. And yet he did put him to death. Most people, you know, there's exceptions, but most people don't complain about God sending his son to the cross. Even unbelievers will at least occasionally say, I don't know if I believe that. But if it's true, that's a pretty long God. There's exceptions, there's prayers. But most people would say, you know, that's, that's pretty nice that God did that for us. That he offered himself. That Jesus offered himself. Do you understand that Jesus let himself, as it were, be consumed so that we would not be? He never offered strange fire. He never broke the law of God. He made himself the offer. The presidential election, as I said earlier, reminds us right, of the need for holiness. One candidate takes the unholy position that unborn life has no rights, and reproductive choice should include the right to the barbaric practice of abortion, taking life that belongs only to God. That is a decidedly unholy position. The other candidate takes the equally unholy position, apparently, that women are sport, put on earth to be treated as sex slaves to be dominated instead of the image bearers created by God that they are to be treated with tenderness and respect. And then there is us, a country full of very unholy people. And so we get unholiness on the ballot and we get unholy rulers. And I'm not arguing for a theocracy, by the way. You know, let's, let's get everybody out, put all the Christians in. I realize God did not promise us a Christian government ultimately until Jesus returns. I'm only saying this, that what happens on the national front is a reminder to us, just as it was to them that day, that perhaps God's way to send a message to us, if we underestimate holiness, we will get the profane. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are so gracious to remind us of uh, Christ, the one and ultimate holy man who never broke your law and never offered strange fire, but instead set himself on that altar, as it were, a wooden cross, so that we 
every one of us sinners, sinning in many ways, would not be justly consumed. Father, we pray this morning for those that do not, have not embraced Jesus. Maybe they're trying to get to heaven by their own contrived holiness. Or maybe they're so entrenched in their sin they don't even care about holiness anymore. Father, awaken them with new affections. Open their eyes. Help them to see so that they will not perish. We pray these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. If the Lord is uh, prompting you this morning, come and pray. Maybe you need to recommit yourself to holiness. Maybe you say, you know, I, I know I've been saved. I know that I've put my faith and trust in Jesus. But right now in my life, my whole, maybe it's not something anybody can see. It's your thoughts or whatever it is. Your private time. It's not holy as it should be. You can settle that. You can start again in the Lord. Um, come and maybe grab somebody and pray, or maybe pray on your own. Uh, but let's also, as always, evangelistically pray for those that do not yet know Christ as the Holy One. Let's respond to the same point. Thank you.